Hi, I'm John Davidson, lead pastor at Evangel Temple. Thank you so much for tuning into the message today. I hope it's a blessing and an encouragement to you. If it is, leave us a note in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. I hope you enjoy this message from God's Word today. This morning, though, we are going to be jumping into Matthew chapter 13. So if you brought your Bible, grab that, whether you brought the paper Bible like I did, or you brought your device, Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to be reading a pretty good chunk of scripture this morning, so keep your Bible out. And we are in this series called Here Comes the Kingdom. So it's a series that where we're walking verse by verse through the book of Matthew. This is really important because as we walk verse by verse through a book of the Bible, we really start to understand what the book is about, what it's trying to communicate to us. And Matthew's a really interesting book. It's what we call a gospel. It's a, a story of the life of Jesus. And of course, you may know that we have four gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew is the first of those. It's the first book in the New Testament. So it's a really significant book. And as we enter into chapter 13, which we started last week, we enter into a section of the book of Matthew where there are a lot of what we call parables. And what is a parable? A parable is a story that Jesus would tell in order to make a point. A parable is a story that makes a point. How many of you have ever been listening to somebody talk and they're rambling on and on and on and on and finally you just stop them and you're like, wait a minute, I just got an, is there a point to this? Are, like, are you going somewhere with this? And they're like, oh no, I'm just telling you a story. Okay, Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't just mindlessly tell stuff like that. No, he tells stories in order to make a point. And so that's what we're going to find as we go through the next 10 or so chapters. We have kind of interspersed some of the activities of Jesus as well as a whole lot of parables. Now, one of the things that Jesus is going to do as he tells parables is he's going to use everyday examples that people can easily understand. As a matter of fact, he uses a lot of agricultural examples, a lot of examples that have to do with animals, uh, because that was part of everyday life for them in the first century, in the Middle East. I mean, animals all around, farmers, shepherding, all that kind of stuff was a part of their life. Not so much the case for us today. So in order to really truly understand what Jesus is trying to say, we have to kind of put ourselves in the shoes of a first century person who would have been listening to Jesus. And that'll help us to understand what Jesus is talking about. Now, a lot of the parables that Jesus tells, in fact, most of them, start with a phrase like this, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he'll tell the story. The kingdom of heaven is like. Or you could say the kingdom of God. Those two phrases are kind of interchangeable. Now, that gives us a clue about the purpose of parables. Parables help us to understand what the kingdom of God is like. But by extension, not only do they tell us what the kingdom of God is like, they tell us what the king is like. Because if the kingdom is a certain way, then that must mean that the person who's running the kingdom, the king, is a certain way as well. And so parables give us insight into what the kingdom is like and what the king is like. And then also, to take it one step farther, the parables also, if we'll, if we'll read them closely enough, give us an indication of what the citizens of that kingdom are probably like as well. Okay, so that's you and me. That's people who love the Lord. That's people who have submitted our lives to Jesus and live for him. So parables tell us all of those things. And so every time we read a parable, we should be asking the question, what does this tell me about the kingdom of God? What does it tell me about the king? And what does it tell me about my place in the kingdom of God? Okay, so we're going to get into chapter 13 now. One of the things you need to know about chapter 13 is that Jesus tells six parables just in chapter 13 alone. Okay, so he is going off on parables in chapter 13, telling one after another after another. And some of them he doesn't explain. There's just kind of a, an assumption that the reader is going to understand because it's clear enough what he's saying. But other times Jesus takes the opportunity to explain the parable, which he's going to do with our parable today. The interesting thing about our parable that we're going to talk about today is that Jesus tells this parable, this story, as he's out preaching and teaching to the crowds. And then later, when Jesus is with his disciples alone, they ask him if he'll explain the parable. And he says yes, and he explains it. 
but the telling of the parable and the explanation from Jesus about what the parable is about is separated by a few paragraphs. So this brings us to a really interesting point. Don't make the mistake as a, as a believer in Jesus who wants to learn about the Lord and, and is doing that by reading your Bible, don't make the mistake of just picking a verse here and a verse here and a verse here and reading that and thinking that you're really learning a lot from God's Word because uh, honestly, sometimes that can do you more harm than good. As a matter of fact, it's not even necessarily that great when we leverage the individual little sections in, within chapters that the, um, that the editors in our Bible put in there. They put these little section headings to help us know what a little section of Scripture is about. Sometimes we'll just read a little section, which may be three or four or five or six verses, and we'll be done for the day. But honestly, that sometimes is not very helpful either, because what we really need to do is we need to understand what God is trying to say in context, right? Understand the whole story of it. And so, if you just open Matthew chapter 13 and picked out one little passage, there's a really good chance that you would either be reading Jesus' telling of the parable or his telling of the explanation of the parable, but not both. And you really need to understand both in order to understand what Jesus is, the point that Jesus is trying to make, okay? One more thing before we read this. And you're like, is he ever going to actually get to the, the passage of Scripture? I promise I will. In addition to the primary parable that we're going to talk about today, at the very end of Matthew chapter 13, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to tell another little bitty parable that will reinforce the main parable that we're going to talk about today. So we're just going to read it all, okay? We're going to read a bunch of scripture today, and I think you'll be able to understand when we read it, you'll be able to kind of connect the dots and see how it's all connected. But let's, let's get into Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. This is what it says. Here is another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like, see there's that phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat and then slipped away. When the crops began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. Should we, uh, and they said, uh, where did they come from? An enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Should we pull out the weeds? They asked. No, he replied, you'll uproot the wheat if you do. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them into bundles, and burn them, and put the wheat into the barn. Okay, first of all, before we go on, that's cold. Like, who would do something like that? Like, you'd have to be serious enemies with somebody to be so mad at them that you would sneak into their field in the middle of the night and plant weeds. I mean, that's, that's pretty cold. Have any of you ever done that before? No, you don't have to raise your hand. Some of you, some of you are really mad at your neighbor and you snuck into their garden in the backyard and planted some stuff that they didn't want. Um, that's pretty cold, you know? But Jesus is using this example, this kind of extreme example, again, in order to make a point. Okay, so it's very likely that the weed that Jesus is referring to here is called Darnell. Darnell has been referred to as false wheat, and we got a picture of it that we'll put on the screen. Because uh, it grows, Darnell grows in areas where wheat also grows, and it's a major problem for farmers, and has been for a long, long time, especially before the invent of modern farming equipment that could separate these things. It's a problem because they look so much alike, but you don't realize that one is different from the other until they kind of come to maturity until the ear of the plant where the seeds are uh, really begins to, to form. And then you can tell what is the weed and what is the wheat. But until then, in the early stages of their growth, they're really uh, almost indistinguishable. And the reason why Darnell is so bad is not just because it's a weed and you don't want it or it doesn't taste good. They can actually make you sick if you eat too much of it. And some people said that it can even give you like a feeling of of being drunk when you when you eat too much of it so it's almost like has a toxic nature to it so farmers obviously don't want it but like jesus says in the parable the challenge is by the time you know which is wheat and which is weed the roots are intertwined and so if you pull the weed out then you're going to pull the good wheat out too so the farmer says to his workers hey just wait be patient and then when it comes to harvest time, we'll harvest all of it and separate them at harvest time. Until then, 
the good plants and the bad plants coexist together in the field. And then a few verses later, we have the explanation of what Jesus was trying to teach. Let's read this together. Matthew chapter 13, verse 36. So we're going to skip down to verse 36. It says this, Then leaving the crowds outside, Jesus went into the house. And his disciples said, Please explain to us the story of the weeds in the field. Jesus replied, The Son of Man, who, by the way, is that's Jesus' way of referring to himself. The Son of Man is the farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the world, and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one, and the enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the harvesters are the angels. Just as the weeds are uh, sorted out and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will remove his, from his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom, and anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. So Jesus goes through, and he describes every single character in this story, which is awesome. It's so helpful for us because it helps us not only understand what Jesus was trying to say, but it also gives us insight into kind of how Jesus' mind works and, and why he would tell parables in this way. So he says, that Jesus himself is the farmer who is planting the good seed. And the good seed are his people, people who love him and have submitted their lives to him, which is the story for many of us here in this room today. But he says the devil is also at work in the field, and he's planting bad seed. And bad seed results in people who buy into the devil's lies and who reject God. And Jesus says in this parable that there will come a day when the farmer will come in and harvest everything that's in the field and separate the good from the bad. But until then, the good and the bad, the wheat and the weeds, are together coexisting in the field or in the world. And you know this to be true, right, from your own experience, that, the, that people who love God and trust God and are trying to do right and live right are are surrounded by and living next to coexisting in the world with people who don't care about God, people who have rejected Him. Living in the same communities. Working in the same jobs together. Living in the same neighborhood. Sometimes living in the same house together. Sometimes sleeping in the same bed together. People who love the Lord and people who don't people who have surrendered their lives to Jesus and people who haven't. And you can't always tell by looking at somebody from the outside, are they a wheat or a weed? <laughs> you can't always tell. Does this, is this a person who is submitted to the Lord or somebody who's not? You can't always tell. What, when you can tell is when you get up close to them and you can examine their life and you can kind of taste the fruit of their life and then you can say, oh, okay, yeah, this is a person who genuinely loves Jesus. This is a person who's genuinely trying to do right and live right and living by God's word but this person is not. Now, before we unpack what all of this means for me and you today, I want to do what I said earlier, and I want to slip down toward the end of Matthew chapter 13 and read this other short little parable that Jesus gives us because it's going to reinforce this same parable of the wheat in the field. And this is what it says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net that was thrown into the water and caught fish of every kind. I love Jesus because he's full of stories, and he's got multiple ways of making a point. When the net was full, they dragged it up on the shore, sat down, and sorted the good fish into crates, but threw the bad ones away. That is the way it will be at the end of the world. The angels will come and separate the wicked people from the righteous, throwing the wicked into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So again, Jesus tells this second parable now that's really making the same point as the first parable. You see the similarities. There's the good and the bad coexisting together, and then at the end of the world, at Judgment Day, the good and the bad get separated out. Okay, so what does all this mean for me and you? Well, you remember that when I was talking about 
the purpose of parables, I said that we need to ask three questions every time we come to a parable. And we're going to ask those three questions today as, as kind of an example of what you can do even in your own personal Bible study at home as you're reading through these parables. Three simple questions to ask yourself. The first one is this, what does this parable teach me about the kingdom of God? And the answer is this, it teaches us that the kingdom is real and eternal. The kingdom of God is real and and eternal. What do I mean by that? Well, the whole point of Jesus' story is to, to show us that this life on earth is not all there is. There, there will be a finish line in this world. There will be a judgment day, or what's referred to in this uh, parable as the end of the world. The, the, the come, coming to a time when time is no more. Everything's going to stop, and there is going to be a judgment day. And the Bible says in this parable and in many other places that there are two options for how we can spend eternity after this life is over. One option for those who put their faith and trust in Jesus is that they can go to their eternal reward, what we commonly think of as heaven. The Bible actually describes this place in the book of Revelation at the very end of Revelation as the new heavens and the new earth. That, that uh, existence where God and his people will be together forever. No wickedness will be there. No pain will be there. There will be no tears there. It will just be enjoying the presence of the Lord forever. And the other option for where we spend eternity is eternal separation from God. Now we commonly think about this place as hell okay so the, the bible actually has other names for this place as well uh, if you go in, into the end of the book of revelation uh, you see these words lake of fire this is where the devil and his demons and those who follow him are eventually put for eternity um, it's probably not so much a place like a, a, a geographical location as it is a a manner of existing that is just totally void of the presence of god so Jesus says there, there are these two eternities, and they are, they are very real, and they are very eternal. Our souls are eternal. Did you know that when this life is over, when your body gives up and you die, you don't just cease to exist. You don't just, like, poof, disappear. You don't just go to sleep and never wake up. Uh, you don't, uh, there's no such thing as reincarnation. I'm sorry to disappoint you. You can't, you can't come back as a spider or a goat or whatever it was that you were hoping to come back as. Probably not many of you wanting to come back as a goat, but you never know. Um, that's not a real thing. That's not an option that the Bible gives us. And in spite of what Catholicism has taught for 700 or so years, there's no such thing as purgatory. Now, this is another thing. Some of you may have grown up in a Catholic background, and I just want to take this moment. to I'm not trying to, to knock uh, Catholicism. I'm just going to say... Um, that's, a, that's a belief that is not represented anywhere in the Bible. So uh, this idea that we go to purgatory, which is like a waiting stage where our souls are purged from all of the evil in us so that eventually we can be clean enough or good enough to go on to the next stage of eternity, just, that just doesn't exist in, in the Bible. So there are really only two options that Scripture gives us for how we spend eternity, and that is... If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, you can spend eternity forever in the presence of God, both here, by the way, here in this world and after this world is over. But if you don't put your faith in Jesus, then you spend eternity and you spend your life here on earth in separation from God. Now, this isn't very popular right now. This is not a popular teaching because it seems very exclusive. And there's a lot of people out there that would be like, hey, there's lots of other options, you know. Like, I believe when I die, I'm just going to become part of the universe. That's, that's so cool. That, that, that's a cool thought. It really, it really is. I mean, honestly, I wish that's the, uh, the, the way it worked because that would, that would be a really cool thing. But that's not one of the options that God's Word gives us, actually. And, and so if we're, if we're going to put our faith and hope in something, I would encourage you to put your faith and your trust in God's Word, which tells us that there are two options about where we spend eternity. There's no other alternatives. And if you want to spend eternity with God later, when this life is over, 
there's a very clear way for you to do that, and that is to surrender your life to Jesus, to, to, to believe in what Jesus has done for you, giving himself as a sacrifice for your sin, where your sins can be forgiven, and you can find healing and hope in him. That is the only way that the Bible tells us that we can spend eternity in the presence of God. And this is, I know this is a very logical way to think of it. It's kind of how my brain works. I'm thinking, if you knew, if you knew, 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 for sure, for sure, for sure, that there were only two options, and there was a clear way to spend eternity in the presence of God, and to avoid an eternity that is um, uh, separated from the presence of God, wouldn't you do it? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you take the route that gets you into God's presence forever? I hope that you would. And if you haven't made that decision today, I would, I would ask you, I would beg you to make the decision to follow Jesus today to ensure that you can spend eternity in the presence of the Lord. Don't go home and sleep on it. Don't go home and say, I'm going to get my stuff together and then come back and, and submit my life to Jesus later. No, I won't. Do it now. Do it today. Because you don't know what today holds. You don't know what tomorrow holds. So do it today. So what does this parable teach us about the kingdom of God? Well, it teaches us the kingdom is real and eternal. The second question I told you we should ask about parables is, what does this parable teach us about the king? And here's the answer. This parable teaches us that our king, Jesus, is just but patient. He is just but he is patient. Let's talk about that for a minute. I've been telling you about how there will become a time, there will come a time at the end of the world where, where God will separate his children from those who have decided to reject him. Now, this sounds very bad, especially, I think, in the world that we live in today. People are like, oh, Christianity is so exclusive, and y'all talk about judgment and God throwing people into hell, hell, and that's so mean, that's so terrible. What kind of God would do that? Well, th think of it this way. God is just, which means he always does what is right, and, um, and, and in his doing what is right, he will give you eventually what you want. This is part of how, this is part of how God acts, how, how, how God behaves in the world. If a person makes a decision that they want to reject God, they don't want to have anything to do with them in this world, while they're alive, there will come a time where God will say, Okay, if that's what you want, that's what I will give you. And your eternity will be outside of the presence of God forever. Now, on the other hand, many of you in this room have made the decision that you want a relationship with God. You want to be in the presence of God. You want the blessings that come along with being a child of God. And for you, there will come a day, at judgment day, when God will say, you know what, that's what you wanted. You have always wanted to be in my presence. You have always wanted to be around me. You have always wanted to be in my family and in my kingdom. So now forever, from now until forever, you will be a part of my kingdom. You will be in my presence. God is just that way. But God is also patient. I don't know if you've ever had this thought, but there are some times that I've thought, God, why don't you just come down and like yank the evil people out of this world? Just like take care of them. Have you ever thought about that? Maybe that's just me. I'm being honest here. This is a safe place, right? So there are some people that are so hard-hearted. They have rejected God so much. Their hearts are so evil. They, they, they do so much to hurt people that I I've, that I've thought, Lord, why don't you just take care of them? You know, why don't you just, why, why don't you just do away with them? Why don't you yank them out of the world? Because they're not doing the world any good. Literally, the only thing they bring to the world is harm and hurt and heartache and pain. Well, the answer why God doesn't do that is because God is being patient. And patience is not a virtue of God's that we talk about a lot. But the Bible actually explains very clearly that God indeed is patient. As a matter of fact, Second Peter chapter 3 Verse 9 says this, The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise to return for us, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. So why is God being patient? Why does he not just go ahead and yank those weeds out of the world? Why does he not just go ahead and judge people who are evil and wicked and harming? God is being patient with them, hoping that they might turn their hearts to him. God is bending over backwards. He's showing patience. He's enduring the sinfulness and wickedness of the world so that hopefully more people will have time to come to know his love. Now, how does that happen? How does, how does a person who is sinful and wicked and rejecting God become a person who loves God and is pursuing God 
and wants a relationship with God. How in the world does that happen? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because the answer to that is the answer to the third question that I told you we should ask about parables, which is what does this parable teach me about my role as, as a citizen in the kingdom of God? And here's the answer to that question. People who are a part of God's kingdom, his kingdom citizens, rescue others, bringing them into the kingdom of God. That is the role of a kingdom citizen, I believe, according to this parable. If you were to unpack this thing, if Jesus was to go in depth more and teach on this, he would probably, if he was standing here today, he would tell me and you that we are side by side in the world with people who are rejecting him for a reason. He's allowed us to live this life next to people who are rejecting God because he is so patient and he so desperately wants them to come to know him that he has put you in their life in order to extend an invitation for them to come into the kingdom of God. When a Jesus follower meets somebody who doesn't know the Lord and somebody who is rejecting God, it, it's like this mysterious, miraculous, wonderful thing can happen where this person who doesn't know the Lord might look at your life as a Jesus follower and say, listen, there's, there's something different about your life. There is something going on in your, in your life, in your attitude, in your mind, in your heart that I want as a part of my life. Tell me more about that. And it gives you an opportunity to extend an invitation for them to come into God's family, into God's kingdom. And the miracle, really, of the good news about Jesus is that somebody who is a weed today can become wheat tomorrow. Isn't that amazing? Somebody who is a weed, a follower of the devil, somebody who is bought into the devil's lives can become wheat tomorrow. All it takes is for them to encounter somebody like you, a believer in Jesus who's willing to share their testimonies, share their faith, and say, look, this is what Jesus did in my life, and Jesus can use your presence in their life, can use your testimony, your story, to bring about change, a miraculous change, a wonderful change in their life. And, and when that happens, and that person who has been rejecting God and saying, I don't want to have anything to do with you, when they hear your testimony, your story, and they hear the good news about Jesus, and they make a decision to turn their life over to him. It's almost like, have you ever seen a train track that's, that's at one of these places where it switches? That's like what happens in the life of a person when they come to know Jesus. It's like the, the, the train track that they're traveling down switches, and rather than going this way, they go this way. Rather than going to eternal pain and destruction forever for eternity, they find themselves going this way toward the kingdom of God and the family of God and eternal life in the presence of God. Again, all because their life interacted with your life. And I think God wants to use some of you to help make that kind of change in the lives of people around you. I believe, I believe God wants to use you in that way. Worship team, why don't you guys come back up here? We're going to spend a few minutes here at the end of our service just kind of worshiping and praying together and responding in our own way to God's word. Every single one of us have people in our lives who are not living for the Lord. I really believe that. You may live the most insular life, but I promise you somewhere in your family, friends, people that you work with, you got somebody who's not living for the Lord. And some of you are surrounded by people who are not living for God. So all you have to do is turn to the left or right, and you're going to, you're gonna, uh, you know, you, you just walk into the office, or you just walk into your school classroom, and you're going to interact with people who are not serving Jesus. God has put you in their life for a reason, friends, to invite them into his kingdom. But our patience that we extend to them can't be passive. It has to be active. We can't just be the kind of Christians that sit around and say, well, I just can't wait till Jesus returns and takes me out of this place, and until then I'm going to tolerate all the sinners and all the, all the people who are not serving God, and I'm just going to keep my head down and kind of mind my own business. That's, that's being patient waiting for the Lord's return, but it's a very passive kind of patience. I believe that God is calling us to be active patient, to be people who, as we're waiting for the return of the Lord, we're active about his work. We're working in his field. As a matter of fact, Jesus said this in uh, John chapter 9, verse 4. He said, we must work, he, we must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us by the one who sent us. The night's coming when no one can work. 
There's coming a day when the time for working, the time for, for witnessing, the time for sharing our testimony, the time for extending an invitation to people to come into God's kingdom, that time will come to an end. There won't be any more time. There won't be any more chances. There won't be any more opportunity. But for now, there's time to work. There's time for me and you to work in the field. And I encourage you today to get about your work in the kingdom business, to be a worker for the king, someone who's inviting people into the kingdom. You know, we have a really interesting opportunity over the next couple of weeks. Not only do we have interesting opportunities every day to share Christ with people, but over the next two weeks leading up to Easter, it's a really great opportunity for us as Christians to share with people about our faith. Because in spite of the way that the world is going and the direction that people are kind of going with their faith and walking away from God and I think becoming less and less receptive to things of God, we still live in a country and, and even in a part of the country that is generally aware of things relating to Christianity. Now, it may not be that way forever. As a matter of fact, it probably won't. And that's why we should work as hard as we can, as fast as we can, to tell as many people as we can about Jesus. Because I believe that our window for sharing our faith effectively is probably closing in terms of uh, people's receptivity. But for now, we still live in a time and place where people in our community are generally aware of Easter. They may not even know what Easter means or what it's all about. Maybe all they know is when they walk into Walmart during March, they find that the candy aisle is all pastel candies and there's peeps and bunnies and, and Easter eggs and, and they know that has something to do with Christianity or church or Jesus or something, but they may not know exactly what it means. This gives you and I a perfect opportunity because statistics still show over and over and over that people in our nation, especially our part of the nation, are still most likely to attend church around Easter and Christmas if they don't go any other time of the year. Now, like I said, it may not be that way forever, but it is for now. So let's use the opportunity that we have to make invites while we have them. If you've been around here a while, you know that we, we like to give you tools in order to help invite people. And we're gonna do that uh, this this go around as well. We've got Easter invitation cards that we're gonna put at the doors for you as you leave today. There's gonna be somebody who will offer you a card. It just has our service times on it. It says a little bit about what's going on on Easter on the card. And I wanna encourage you to take one of those and be praying about who God wants to, you to give that to. You'll find that on that card, it says things like, we're gonna have inflatables for the kids and stuff like that. And you may think, well, you know, Easter's not about inflatables. Yeah, the card's not for you, <laughs> remember, okay? The card's not for you. The card's for somebody you're gonna give it to who may have children or they may wanna have some place to bring their family and they wanna know, is this gonna be a safe place, a fun place for my kids? And we wanna let them know that ET is that kind of place on Easter Sunday morning. So please uh, take a moment here at the end of our service to pray about who God would have you be speaking to over the next couple of weeks. Who is it in your life? that needs to come into the kingdom of God? Who is it that may be really, really close to the kingdom, but they're just not in yet? And just maybe if you invited them, they'd come with you to Easter Sunday. Matter of fact, let's just take a moment and pray about that right now. Do you think about that person in your life who really needs to know the Lord? And let's just take a moment to bring their name before, before the Lord. Jesus, we... We call out to you on behalf of people in our families, in our homes, people that we work with, people who are friends of ours and neighbors who desperately need to know you. We don't like to think of them as a weed. We don't like to think of them as somebody who is, who is a bad person. Maybe they're not bad. They just, they've bought into the devil's lies. They've not come into a relationship with you, Jesus. And, and we want him to. And we know that as the king, Lord, you are patient. And you have intentionally, strategically put us in their lives to be an example and a witness to them. So I pray over these next few days and weeks that you would allow us to do that. God, help us to be aware of those moments that are God-ordained moments, divine moments, where we can share about your love to people around us. I pray that you'd open the hearts of people who are in our lives. Help them to be accepting of the good news about Jesus Christ, especially during this time of the year. 
Let's just continue to pray for those folks because I just believe the Lord is wanting to use some of you in a new way, in a way that you've never been used before to be a witness. Maybe you have never once in your entire life shared your testimony with somebody. Maybe you've never once shared with somebody about Jesus. And I think God is wanting to use you. If that's you today and you're like, man, I, I would love to be used in that way. I think God would want to use you in that way, friend, to share the message of the good news of the kingdom of God with people around you. I'd encourage you to just be open to the Lord this week. Be open to people and opportunities that God's going to bring into your path. Lord, give us a sensitivity to your spirit to know when you're prompting us to say something. Give us the right words in the right moments to share our faith. Thanks again for watching the service today. I hope it was an encouragement to you. We'd love to hear from you, so if you'd like to leave a note in the comments and let us know what you thought about the message, we'd love that. And if you're ever in the Springfield, Missouri area on a Sunday morning, we'd love to have you join us for church. You can attend our 8 a.m. classic service, or you can join us for church at 9.30 or 11.